Absolutely. So, Perry, let's get into part three. We got a couple more articles to get into. Some good news coming, uh, and some challenges. Right? Uh, we're going to talk first about the challenges. Rising housing prices may actually stall recovery, and this is interesting. I don't think this is really going to affect Austin because we don't have this dynamic going on here. We have job growth. We are a strong pro-employment, low unemployment market with net inflow of people. Jobs are being created here. Now, so what they talk about is in many parts of the real estate recovery, Arizona v. one and other markets like that, the rise in the market had been due to investors and large hedge funds buying properties. And the, and the markets were overrun with distressed property, something that's never been the case in our market here in Austin. So they're converting that property into rentals, so it's not coming back on as resales. And the investors are starting to move from those markets into other weaker markets because the relative discount, like we talked about a couple episodes ago, has disappeared. We used to be talking in a 20%, as much as 30% of your buying in bulk discount to retail for these larger investors, and it went away. I mean, you're talking about a discount that is less than 7% in a lot of markets, and that's not enough of an incentive for an investor. They'd rather go to a place like Ohio, you know, Cincinnati, Cleveland, or places like that in the Rust Belt where they can get a bigger discount, and that's going to lower the demand for markets that had been improving because the underlying job market in these states, Arizona would be one of them, is considerably weaker than the job market in the area that we are, like Texas. It doesn't matter if you want to call it Austin Metro. You could say the same thing about Houston, San Antonio, or Dallas. The overall Texas markets are considerably stronger. So we're not going to see this kind of a trend, but it is an interesting thing. Most investors that buy in Austin want to buy for long-term holds. This is not a you know big market where you see nearly as many people unless they're going to do some improvements to property coming in to do quick flips, whereas that was a lot of what was going on and continuing to go on in markets. And even then, you're seeing that a lot of the properties being converted to rentals in Arizona now, too, because the discounts are not there anymore. Gotcha. So now let's, let's get some good news. CNBC article, both of these articles were from CNBC, but you know, you, you can't have it all be bad with, with rates the way they are and, and, and what's going on. The pending home sales numbers came out, and, and these numbers are just incredible how strong it is given how weak the economy is overall. Again, this is not a Texas-specific thing. This is national. Texas has continued to be strong. We've talked about our unemployment rate being much lower than the national. But if you look at October, compared to September, it's up 5.2%, the number of pendings in the fall. And we see this in Austin. It's even stronger here. September 2011 versus now, up 13.2% year over year. Wow. It's the highest level since March of 2007. Isn't that amazing? You're talking some crazy strong numbers. Now, what can derail this? Fiscal cliff a return to even higher unemployment numbers. But again, we're somewhat insulated in Austin. Not completely, but somewhat insulated from the standpoint that our market has a job and employment and entrepreneurial pro-growth culture that is attracting people. And where are they going if they can't buy yet because they couldn't sell their house? They're going into rental properties here. You know, And I've got a buyer coming in that's decided to rent for six months because they couldn't sell their house in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see that. So I, I expect we'll be talking about this a lot. You know, and just as an aside before we jump into uh, some of the other items we're going to cover today, uh, as I expected, and I was the pessimist of the two of us on this whole fiscal cliff thing, although yeah, I wouldn't call you a complete optimist, <laughs> it, is gonna, it is going to come down to the wire, clearly going to come down to the wire. You know, there, there's a lot of showmanship going on. There's a lot of game playing on the fiscal cliff. It is an unmitigated fiasco. And we're all going to pay the price if they don't get their act together here in another couple of weeks. What most people don't realize is Americans that are head down and playing with their iPads and iPhones and doing their day-to-day -day activities is we got about two weeks left for them to figure this out. And... You know, at the end of two weeks, Congress recesses, the president's going to Hawaii on vacation for three weeks, and come December 31st, it all hits. So two episodes from now, we're going to have a really good idea 
about what to expect for the first quarter. And we'll probably just do a special episode about, okay, here's where we're at. Because one of the things they're doing is they're talking about modifying exemptions and the mortgage exemption may be wrapped up inside of that like we talked about two weeks ago. So mm -hmm. we're going to have some interesting times here. You, if you didn't think we're going to get a slow little respite here in December, did you? You know, I was hoping that something. <laughs>